Hello and welcome to another episode of 360 Health. I am Ogechuku Ukikwe. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has recently revealed groundbreaking portable ultrasound technology as part of its effort to tackle the alarming mortality rates of pregnancy-related complications in remote areas in Africa. The president of Gender Equality of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Anita Zaidi, disclosed this on the sideline of the Women Left Health Global Conference 2024 in Tanzania. Addressing a global audience, Zadi emphasized the dire need for accessible diagnostic tools in regions with scar healthcare facility. She explained that innovative ultrasound devices, compact as a water bottle and equipped with artificial intelligence compatibility, aim to revolutionize parental care by enabling care detention of life-threatening conditions. A coalition of non-governmental organizations, civil society scaling up nutrition in Nigeria has warned that malnutrition continues to pose greatest threats to child survival in Nigeria. Despite various intervention, malnutrition remains a significant public health concern and a hindrance to child growth and development. According to the World Health Organization, malnutrition refers to deficiencies or excesses in nutrient intake, imbalance of essential nutrients, or impaired nutrient utilization. The United Nations International Children Emergency Fund, UNICEF, reported that nearly half of all deaths in children under 5 are attributed to undernutrition, which also increases the risk of deaths from common infection. Despite these challenges, civil society scaling up nutrition in Nigeria has made significant strides in addressing malnutrition nationwide, partnering with government agencies, development partners, the media and communities to implement nutrition intervention. We we'll go on a short break and when we return, we'll be discussing causes, effects of mental health issues. Don't go away. Welcome back. The Coordinating Minister for Health and Social Welfare, Ali Party, says unemployment, social, economic and family issues have been listed as factors, among others, that could be responsible for mental health issues. The minister made the disclosure in Akdeokiti during the grand finale of the 6th anniversary of Afa Babalawad University Multi-System Hospital. Speaking with journalists, party represented by the National Coordinator for National Mental Program at the Federal Ministry of Health, Tunji Ojo, highlighted stigmatization, economic hardship, poverty, drug addiction, lack of accessibility to quality health care services, amongst others, as factors responsible for mental health conditions in the country. Well, joining me to discuss this further is Chief Consultant Psychiatrist Dr. Oluwa Fumilayo Akinola. Thank you for joining me on the program, Ma. The Coordinating Minister of Health and Social Welfare, Ali Party, says employment, social economic and family issues have been listed as factors that could be responsible for mental health issues. What's your take on this? Well, I, I think it's correct. We do know that all the social factors can affect one's mental health. If you don't have a job, you wake up in the morning and you know you have a job somewhere to go. It gives you a sense of well-being you know, because you know that you are productive and you are doing something. So lack of employment, all these social issues can definitely make a, um, a case of mental illness worse. So what role do genetics play in the development of mental health disorder? Well, as we all know, genetics play a huge role. We do know that when we talk about causes, causation of illnesses, we talk about the genetics, we talk about the environment and the nurture. So that means the genetic makeup of the individual, then the environment, where that person is born into, where the person grew up, he or she grew up, and all have effect on mental health. And we know that there are some of these um, types of mental illness that runs in families. So it's genetic. So it could be, you know, immediately the parents or even grandparents. And it's, so you really don't know the generation that's going to come out. But definitely, some mental illnesses have a genetic connotation with them. And it does run in families, you know. For example, you have um, somebody that has depression. So you could, they could be an issue of a mood disorder. 
in the family, either depression or a bipolar disease. Or, for example, schizophrenia. We know schizophrenia runs in families. And so these are all the things that we do when we are, you know, doing counseling. We really need to find out whether this had presented in the family before or not. So genetics play a huge role. You can pass from one generation to the other. Okay, so how does early childhood trauma impact mental health in later life? Well, I mean, you know we are talking about psychiatry, so most times we know that it's not usually one cause, it's usually multifactorial. So things that happen, and we know that from things that happen to a child from around the age of 15, that's when whatever is going to happen in adulthood will start. You know, so what's going to happen in adulthood will start. So we always talk about things happening in childhood having an effect on um, what is going on. So, for example, trauma to a child, either medically, injury to the brain, family problems, you know, toxic family environment, abuse of any kind, child abuse, is it neglect? Is it that the child was not properly fed, was not taking care, the child was not able to go to school? or just the toxic environment where there's a lot of emotional or verbal abuse. All these things can have effects at, on that child at that point in time. And if it is not looked into, you know that sometimes in adulthood, it will now present, it will now present as a mental illness. And we know that from the age of 15, most adults that present with psychiatric illnesses the trauma, the illness, the effect will have started at the age of 15. So that's why we are concerned about our child and adolescent age group to really, you know, take care of them so that once there's anything going on in their lives, well, it is important that we attend to it at that point in time and don't leave it until they are adults. When it will now, it can now present as a full-blown psychiatric illness. So trauma of any kind, you know, in childhood can and sometimes do lead to psychiatric illnesses in adults. Okay, so what societal factors contribute to the prevalence of mental health issues? None. We've talked about some unemployment, toxic family environment, the childhood illnesses. I talked about congenital causes, so that's a really key. At birth, a lot of trauma just before, during, immediately after birth. You know, sometimes even mental illness in the mother can cause, because the mother that is ill and is not treated, usually have adverse effects on that child. Anything that can cause a very high fever, you know, that is not attended to, can lead to trauma to the brain. The child fell, maybe from the bed, from the height, the traffic accident, they are fighting and something is hit on the individual's head. Um, any infection that can cause trauma to the brain, space occupying vision in the brain, all these things can have, even sometimes food, what is going on in other systems in the body, all these things can have effects on our mental health. And all of us must remember that to have adequate sleep, are we sleeping well? Are we eating well? Are we able to deal with issues as they occur in our lives? And don't repress things. Don't talk about it and just you know keep pushing it down, down into your consciousness. So all these things can have effect on our mental health. So it's quite wide. Like I said, the causes of mental illness is multifactorial. So anything and everything can trigger it. Right now, what is going on? We have a lot of groups that are using substances. So sometimes this um, drug, substances they take, can cause the mental health breakdown. So it's, you know, it's just enormous. Anything that can affect the brain can and sometimes it can cause mental health illness. So can lifestyle choices as well as the nature of our job affect mental health okay so if you take 
So we are talking about the nature of our jobs and lifestyle. Yes. So for example, now, uh, we talk about lifestyle. We talk about sedentary lifestyle. Look at Lagos, for example. I mean, it's a bit better now, maybe because the price of oil has gone up. You know, we used to have a lot of traffic in Lagos. So you spend hours in traffic, you get to your office, you are seated practically all day. Even after COVID, people stopped going to work. So they were working from home and you sit in front of your computer all day. If you don't do exercises and you just eat, you eat and you are seated like that all day. And sometimes you just eat junk. Most people in Lagos eat junk because you eat while you're on the way to work or you come back late at night, 11 p.m., that's when you need to go to bed. All these have a lot of, can have a lot of effects because, for example, it can cause hypertension, you're not healthy, depending on your age, depending on your age, as you're getting older, 40, above 50, there's a likelihood of diabetes coming up. Hypertension can have, hypertension can have effect on the brain, we have so many things that we can cause, different kinds of illnesses in the brain. Then even when we live sedentary lifestyles, people tend to put on weight. Don't forget diabetes, obesity, and self-esteem. You are now fat, and you are worried I can't lose weight. Uh, weight. I'm the only one that is fat amongst my friends or amongst my colleagues. So we talk about issues of low self-esteem. People start losing their confidence. You can actually de develop depression. We heard about the singer that they found her dead in her home maybe two or three days ago. She apparently she, was, she had issues with her weight almost all her life, and she used to have bouts of depression. So our lifestyle do have all these things can affect our mental health. So the way we live our life and our jobs. So you see that it's interconnected. For example, you have a job that you don't sleep. I know somebody now is always awake all night, working, working, working on the computer. Sleep, having adequate sleep at night is very important for our health. And eating good nutritious meal, very, very important. So when you don't sleep and you continue like that continuously, you know, you start having problems with sleep. It has effects. You can have any with the people, some people eventually break down particularly if it is back to back. And one of the symptoms of mental illness that first of all arises is poor sleep. Because when we sleep, that is when we have restorative sleep. Our brain is supposed to be there to rest and restore itself. You remember everything that you have read, everything you have done. You can now store them into long-term memory. So it is so restorative for us to sleep at night. So when you have a job, when you sleep, and you know, you don't sleep at night, you say you come back, you sleep during the day. Sleeping during the day is not the same thing as sleeping at night. So each has its own effect. So, and the kind of job that, you know, people stay in doors, you don't go out, you don't even see the sun. Now that practically everybody's working from home, maybe particularly in developed countries, some places now in Nigeria too, they started working from home. So you are there in front of your computer all day. You don't go out. It is important that the sun shines on you. As simple as that may sound, you know. So these are the different ways, and of course, our lifestyle here. There's so much noise. There's no electricity. There's generator. The noise. The pollution. All these things have effect on our lives, on our bodies. And when you're not well, you can actually. If one has, for example, chronic illnesses. We do know that people that have chronic illnesses also can come down with mental health problems. Okay, so like you mentioned, stress is one of the things that can impart mental health. So what are the effective coping mechanisms? Yes, you, you do know that stress can actually make, I mean, somebody that is already on the verge, or there's a genetic predisposition, there's a family issue, and you now have stress coming in, tremendous stress. So I think the most important thing from all that I have said is that number one, all of us should know ourselves, so when your body is telling you that you are stressed, you need to rest. I think all of us must find time. I'm sure you've heard it. It's on everybody's lips now. Self-love. Take care. Self-care. 
you that you work in situations that involve a lot of tension, you need to use your head, you need to use your physical strength to do your work. You must always find time to rest, adequate sleep, good food, and you know, not just thinking about anything and just taking your rest. So, coping skills, you know when you're tired, when you're stressed, so step back and take a rest. That when you know you are given an assignment, you know you can't do it. There's no harm in asking for help. Nobody can do everything. We are not expected to do everything at work. All of us must learn to also delegate. So we delegate. If you cannot delegate, do not, you can't do it, ask for help. How do I go about this? Don't put yourself under a lot of stress. Then don't think you are superman or superwoman. Like, eh, there's somebody to do it at work. So I just took it off and I'm doing it. No. You must, everybody must know these or our limits. So delegate, get other people to do the work. Another coping skills, you know the things that you can solve, that ability to know the things that you can actually deal with and the things you can't deal with. So when issues happen, can I affect what has happened? Is there any way I can do something? I can give a vivid example because I deal with a lot with this young adult. So you have carryovers in school. That is basically your fault as a student. So you're supposed to visit your exams, isn't it? So you go back, maybe summer school, you do all that. But if it is ASU that goes on strike and you want to move from, maybe you want to graduate that year, is there anything you can do about that? So there's nothing. So there's no point stressing on that because you can't change it. ASU and federal government, those are the two fighting. And we know that when two elephants fight, it's usually the grass that will suffer. So while that strike is going on, go and find something else to do. Maybe you do a vocational training or you do more courses. So those are coping things. During the last strike, I actually had a, a client of mine that committed suicide because of the cancer strike. I know she just thought, how old is she? 27, she has not any school, no husband, no this, no that. And the strike was just on ending, and she took her own life because she was already she was already a patient, so she took her life. So those are coping skills, but the ones that you know you can solve. So I was one that did pass that exam, okay, for whatever the reason, either I didn't read well enough, or I didn't answer all the things speak well enough before I went for the exam. So I got into the exam or and I had to talk. I couldn't remember everything. So you know that you are the one that will prepare. Then one of the coping skills is you must, when you have planning, don't have one plan for a, for a situation. You must have a plan A, plan B, and sometimes a plan C. So if this does not work, then you can go to the other plan. So these are all coping skills. And I told you earlier on, like I said earlier on, yeah, you, all of us must know our body. Our uh, composition once they are tired, step back. You know, many people don't go on leave. They would rather say their institution to leave them, turn their leave to money, and they work all year long. It is very wrong. They are all supposed to rest, find time to rest, cope. If you have issues that you have thought about, you can't, you do not have an, a, a solution to it, then talk about it. Ask for help. Nobody can know it all. And like I tell people, nobody can do life alone. So we must always ask for help when due. Don't bottle things up. Talk about it. Because when you bottle it up, it's as if it becomes like a mountain in your presence because you think and think and think and think, you don't need to sleep about it. But you'll be amazed that when you tell somebody else, oh, okay, when it happened to me, that was what I did. Oh, it happened to a cousin, it happened to somebody I knew, and this was, you know. And so you'll be amazed that, oh, so people are actually going to what I am going through. Because sometimes when these issues happen, it's, it's, it will present itself as if you are the only one and it is in life. And there's no problem, there's no issue under the sun that does not have a solution. So if you think about it, you can't find a solution, please seek for help. Ask people, you can seek for professional help and you can also get from people that are close to you. Okay, so what are the effects of untreated mental health disorder on overall well-being? I mean, I, I don't think I should overlive that. 
mental illness should not be left untreated because okay. it does not there's no good there's not nothing good comes from it if it is not treated it only gets worse and worse and the longer it stays for that person to seek help that it becomes more difficult it's take a longer time to help a person to get well so it is important as long as you know that you think something is going on and people around you can notice that there's something they are not saying you should make diagnosis just encourage the individual to come and seek for assessment it is better that you come we assess and we say there's nothing wrong rather than sit because most times mental illnesses are always most often insidious what does that mean it starts gradually and it gets worse so it's not until when the person now start destroying things in the house before you know that this person is ill that will have started most times six months one year two years even before that stage so what does that mean it gets worse if it is left untreated so it doesn't speak good of anything so if there's anything wrong please you know, child, young adult, old age, please, it is better that we seek help immediately that we know that something might be going on. Okay? Okay. So how does mental health stigma affect individuals seeking help and treatment? Well, I mean, you said it all. It will make them think to seek treatment because you know that when you talk about stigma, you will have personal stigma. Because you are saying, you are telling yourself, everybody, you know that I have this illness. So I don't want to go to see the hospital. Then there's the general stigma that, you know, even stigma from your family, stigma from your friend. It will amaze you that we are even mental health. Some of our colleagues, too, they stigmatize us because once they hear that you are in psychiatry, I mean, they look, they'll give you, what? You are in psychiatry. How come you ended up in psychiatry, you know? So these are issues. And I, I tell people, if you need help, it's nobody's business. You shouldn't speak for others because they are living their own lives and they are well. So if there's an issue, okay, you don't want to come to stand alone, stand alone hospitals like Yaba, like Aru, you know, like in Kaduna or, and all that. But you have teaching hospitals that have psychiatric departments, psychiatric clinics. We have better medical centers. We have general hospitals that have psychiatric um unit. so just walk into the hospital nobody knows where you are going everybody has one issue or the other so it is better that you seek for help early and don't mind what people will say people will talk on you if you walk on your head they will talk if you walk on your feet they will talk and it is their mouth you are not responsible for them they will say what they want to say but you are responsible for your own life so if you need help please seek appropriate help on time don't let this thing go on until it becomes because if you now leave the individual leave it and it goes on and on until one day you come out on the street and be shouting they start removing their clothes that's when everybody will now look that there's something wrong with this individual so i think we cannot overlook that so stigma prevents people from seeking for appropriate help but I think it is important that we all need to go above that. Because the most important thing is that we are all healthy, physically, mentally, and we can live a productive life. So if I have to go and see a doctor to do that, why not? And if I have to use medication to do that, why not? So lastly, more before I let you go, so what are the long-term effects of medication and therapy on managing mental health condition? I mean, it's going to make the person to function. And you see, it's not a one size fits all because there are different kinds of mental illnesses. <coughs> and sometimes the important thing is to get the person well. You give a drug holiday, you say you stop your medication. But I mean, so it's individualized. Let the individual come. And as the person progresses, is doing well, following doctor's instructions living a happy life, being responsible for their health, then the sky is the limit. They can reach, they can do and, you know, go back to normal life, continue with their life and do well. But if they don't follow their based on what the doctor finds and they don't follow instructions, then they'll be going in and out, up and down, in and out, up and down. So I think the most important, the goal 
is for each patient to have a productive, a happy and productive healthy life. So that is how we tailor each person's treatment and long-term management. We are Chief Consultant Psychiatrics, Dr. Olufumilayo Akinola. Thank you for lending your thoughts on the program. And that's all we can take on this episode of the program. Bye for now.